So now we're turning our attention to a new unit. We're getting into electrostatics and Coulomb's law, electric fields, electric potential. And today in particular, we're going to discuss some concepts related to electrostatics. So we're not really going to be dealing with much in the way of calculations yet today. It's more conceptual and also talking about some fun stuff like lightning safety and related items. So, some motivating questions. So, can cell phones start a fire at the gas pump? And where does lightning come from? And what do we know about it? And you might have heard that if there's lightning about to strike nearby and you're in the middle of a field, you should lie down. Well, we're going to talk about whether or not that's true and why. And what did Ben Franklin do? And what does this have to do with sharks? So, electrostatics is one of those fundamental properties of matter. So it has to do with the fact that charges are really important in all matter that we really deal with. And it turns out that the force between charged particles is much, much, much stronger than the force between massive particles. It's just that we notice the gravitational force because mass kind of adds up and there is no such thing as something like negative mass in order to cancel things out. Whereas generally speaking, for most of the stuff we deal with in the real world, for every positive charge, you have a negative charge kind of trying to cancel that out. <clears throat> but if you're just dealing with, say, a couple of positive charges right next to each other, those the force between those particles is going to be very, very strong, much, much stronger than the gravitational force. So you might ask yourself, how do we know that there are only two types of charge? For example, we often speak in terms of positive and negative charge. Well, what if there was a third type of charge? So think about what would be the implications for a third type of charge. In fact, this might be a good time to pause the video. So if you've given this a good deal of thought, the idea is that if there was a third type of charge, it would be a charge that would have to repel itself just as negative repels negative and positive repels positive. And it would also have to be a type of charge that attracts both negative charges and positive charges. And there is absolutely no experimental evidence for any such type of matter out there. In fact, we have a very good reason theoretically that is inherent in quantum field theory to believe that there is no such thing, that there cannot be any such thing. So we're, we're quite certain that there are only two types of charges. So how do we actually charge objects? There are a number of ways of charging objects, but in general, um, the way that it has to work at the end of the day is that objects gain a net charge by movement of either positive or negative charges. For example, if you wanted to have an object become positively charged, you could either add positive charges to it or cause negative charges to move away from it. Now, you might be thinking, well, we know how everything becomes charged. What's actually going on is a movement of negative charges because, after all, the uh, electrons are 1,836 times less massive than protons, so it must be the electrons that are moving. And in general, that that's really what's going on. It's, it actually is, generally speaking, electrons that are moving, for the most part. But in a lot of batteries, you will actually have chemical reactions taking place such that you actually do have a movement of positive charges in the form of ions moving from one place to another. So it's not always about movement of electrons, but for a lot of the stuff that we're going to be dealing with in physics, it's generally going to be about movement of electrons. And as you know, like charges repel, opposite charges attract. Now, if it's in the middle of winter and you rub your feet against a rug and you go over and zap your sleeping dog on the nose, you have just demonstrated something called the triboelectric effect. By rubbing your feet against the, the rug, you have rubbed charges off of you or added charges to you, and then you have become charged. And since you are able to hold charge for a little while, you're able to go over to your dog and zap your dog. And that will only work once. After that, whenever you rub your feet against the rug, your dog will hear that and your dog will wake up and move somewhere else. But this has to do with electron affinity. Different materials have different degrees of electron affinity and we use the electronegativity scale to 
show how some materials preferentially like to gain or lose negative charges. So here is a representative series of that. So glass, for example, really loves to give up electrons. It, it likes to become positively charged uh, whenever it can. On the other hand, Teflon loves those electrons. So this gives a very nice set of experiments, which we might actually end up doing if we ever get back to school. That is, if you rub glass against Teflon, you will be able to charge both of these things so that if you, you can then use either one to charge something else and accumulate charges there and then use that to um, zap other things etc. So the idea here is the farther apart two things are on the series the larger the charge difference they will create. Now notice it actually is possible for example to rub silk against glass and the result of rubbing silk against the glass well think what would be the result of rubbing silk against glass so you start off with a neutral piece of glass and start off with a neutral piece of silk so maybe pause the video for a few seconds and think about this so if you've given this some thought the realization should end up being that glass hates electrons even more than silk so the result of doing this is that the glass will become positively charged and the silk will become negatively charged now the charge difference won't be as much as what you would get if you rub glass against teflon but it would still be a fairly decent charge difference so that's one of those interesting things to think about even things that don't like electrons will become negatively charged if they rub up against something that hates electrons even more. So if human hair is rubbed on a rubber balloon, for example, well, human hair likes to give up electrons, rubber balloon likes the electrons, the human hair will become positively charged, the rubber balloon will become negatively charged. Or if nylon is rubbed against glass, well, that's similar to the example that we just had. The glass will become positively charged and the nylon will become negatively charged. And you can come up with a number of other examples on this. In fact, I encourage you to kind of pause and come up with a few of your own examples about this. So if you had a group of three, then you could do that. But since we're in the social distancing thing right here, you would at least need to do that virtually. But long story short, the triboelectric effect is this charge by rubbing. This is how static electricity works. And interestingly enough, this is how lightning works as well. It's also how honeybee, or sorry, how bumblebees can collect pollen grains and then deposit them on other plants because as the bumblebees fly through the air, the air molecules end up giving a little bit of a charge to the hair on the bumblebees, which then easily picks up pollen grains due to the uh, dipole that ends up getting induced in the pollen grain, something that we'll talk about some other time. But long story short, if the bee has a charge and the pollen grains have no charge, well, the pollen grains, well, the charge that is like the charge of the bee in the pollen grains will kind of get repelled toward the opposite part of the pollen grains, and the charge that is opposite will end up getting attracted on the near side of the pollen grains toward the bee and since the near side is closer than the far side to the bee there ends up being a stronger force on the attractive end and the pollen grains end up sticking on the bee that's actually the same reason why rubbing a balloon against your hair and then sticking the balloon on the wall is such a great trick because the balloon becomes charged the wall is neutral but then when the charged balloon approaches the wall it chases away the like charges attracts the opposite charges and then the balloon sticks to the wall you should definitely try that especially if you're bored at home right now so ions You've discussed those in chemistry class before, so I'm not going to spend too much time on this. I'm going to kind of skip through some of this stuff because it should be relatively familiar. But ions occur when you take atoms or molecules and give them extra electrons or remove electrons from these atoms or molecules. Now, if we end up ever coming back to class, I plan to show this little video about cell phones at gas stations because sometimes you'll see warnings on gas station pumps that you should not be on your cell phone while you are pumping gas. Well, I am going to be the person you want to shoot and I am going to give away the story here. And the result is that cell phones cannot cause fires at gas stations, at least not due to the charge or anything else that's around them. What ends up happening is sometimes you do get 
fires at gas station pumps, but that has to do with somebody being charged after jumping out of the car and ru having rubbed against the seat of their car and then touching the metal pump area of the gas pump and that zap will end up igniting the gasoline vapor and thus potentially the gasoline. That has happened before and there was one story in India where it did happen and then that got mistranslated and as a result of the mistranslation occurring multiple times across the languages, people had the impression that this happened because of a cell phone. It just so happened the person was holding a cell phone but it had nothing to do with the cell phone. So other things to know about charge. Well, as you know, as we've said several times already, like charges repel, opposites attract, but charge is also quantized. This was discovered by one of Robert Millikan's graduate students back in the late 19th century, that charge is quantized. In other words, there is a smallest unit of charge. Um, that happens to be the magnitude of the electron's charge. It's 1.602 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. The coulomb is the SI unit of charge. And it's something we're going to get to very soon. Now, those of you who know a little bit of subatomic physics might think to yourselves, well, wait a second, what about quarks? Quarks have plus or minus two-thirds or one-third of a, an elementary charge. But quarks are always confined into groups that are either a quark-antiquark -quark pair, with the result being that you have a charge of either zero, plus one, or minus one, or you have a setup of three quarks, the result being a charge of either minus two, minus one, zero, plus one, or plus two. Examples of the latter, well, the proton is two up quarks and a down, so that uh, ends up being a charge of plus one elementary charge. The neutron char is an up quark and two down quarks, so the plus two-thirds of the up quark cancels the two negative one-third charges of the down quarks. Um, there's something called the delta double plus particle, which is just three up quarks. There is a pion, well there's a positive pion which is an up quark and an anti-down quark, there's a negative pion which is a down quark and an anti-up quark, and there's also a neutral pion which is a quantum superposition, there's a nice term for you, of the up quarks and down quarks that ends up canceling out the charges overall. And there are other types of quarks out there as well that end up leading to other either quark-anti-quark -quark pairs or triplets of quarks, but you always have only one only an integer number of elementary charges in the end. And you might wonder, it's like, well, why can't I just take a pair of very fine chopsticks and grab a quark out of the out of a proton or out of a neutron, and then I would have isolated a charge. Well, it turns out that the amount of energy that would be necessary to do that would end up creating more quark-anti-quark -quark pairs, and then they would end up pairing up and creating another uh, particle again to keep uh, every, everything going there. So it turns out it's just not possible to do that. Now, the Coulomb. We mentioned the Coulomb already. It is a very large amount of charge. So if I was to take a charge of one coulomb and zap you with it, well, we would both die. It would be a tremendous disaster, and it would also end up clearing out a large area around us, so that, that would just not be a good thing to do. A coulomb is a whole lot of charge. Why would we both die? Well, that's a calculation that we will get to later in this unit. Now, the charge on the electron is minus one elementary charge, where an elementary charge is this 1.602 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs, and the minus sign comes from the fact that it's an electron. A proton has a charge of plus one elementary charge. And even though it's not listed here, I'll tell you that the symbol for the elementary charge is lowercase e which some people confuse with the electron, but keep in mind the electrons, the charge on the electron is negative e. So in a typical experiment where you rub a Teflon rod with silk, there you're talking about charge differences on the order of um, microcoulombs or often more, more reliably fractions of microcoulombs and smaller units of charge like the ones that might just um, elicit something that you would register as a zap might be on the order of um, nanocoulombs. When we play with the Van de Graaff generator, if we ever get back in class, that will be charges on the order of microcoulombs. So, how is it that pollen grains attach to a bumblebee? How is it that the 
balloon rubbed against your hair is able to stick to the wall. Well, a typical uncharged object will have just all the positive and negative charges roughly evenly mixed. But if you take a charged rod close to it, that is going to chase off the like charges and attract the opposite charges. Well, it turns out that the electric force is such that the closer you are, the much stronger the actual electric force. So it turns out that if we say that this is half the distance to this positive charge as this positive charge is from here, the magnitude of the force that this negative charge feels is actually four times the magnitude of the force of this positive charge. That's something encapsulated in Coulomb's law, which we will discuss in another couple of days or so. But because of the fact that the nearby attractive charge feels a noticeably stronger force than the farther away um, repelling charge means that the pollen grains or the balloon, whatever it happens to be, ends up feeling a force toward the area of charge, even though the object itself has no net charge. Now, a conductor is something in which the charges are free to roam around. The nice analogy that I've heard from my college professor on this, uh, Dr. Paul Wallace, is that in a conductor, the electrons are kind of like dogs that are off their leashes. They are free to roam around the neighborhood, the neighborhood in this case being the surface of the object. Insulators, on the other hand, are situations where dogs are on their leashes. They're, they're only free to move a little bit. They can move around their owners, but they can't go very far. And that is going to have some interesting consequences when we start talking about what happens if a conductor gets struck by lightning. And semiconductors are situations where uh, they can be insulators at some temperatures and conductors at other temperatures. So these, as you know, have a lot of uses in modern day computing. So keep in mind, it is possible to turn any insulator into a conductor. All you need to do is reach the dielectric breakdown of that material. And that's when suddenly the electrons end up jumping across the surface and kind of breaking through and the, the thing ends up becoming a conductor. So that happens if you create a large enough electric field in your insulator. It will then become a conductor. Now, an electroscope is a nice, cute little demo tool in a lot of physics classrooms where if you can see this situation, you have a conducting rod at the end of which are two conducting flaps on a relatively smooth surface so that they can freely move apart or together or whatever, whatever the situation requires. And the result is that if you touch this conducting rod with charges. These charges, since it's a conductor, the charges are free to move around. And remember, these are all like charges, so they repel from each other. So they want to get as far away from each other as possible. So they end up hitting these flaps and accumulating somewhat on the flaps, as well as the rest of the rod to some extent. And they, re they cause the flaps to go farther apart because they are repelling from each other. Interestingly enough, the same thing will happen even if you don't touch the rod. We're going to get to that. So um, this is charging by conduction. You could say charging by contact in this case. Now, there's also a situation called grounding. This is when you make a conducting path to a reservoir of practically infinite but positive and negative charge. Certainly, Earth itself counts as a ground, but a lot of cases, in a lot of cases, um, walls will count as a ground, stuff like that. So, so far we've talked about charging by contact, and we just mentioned grounding. It is also possible to charge by induction. So going back to our, uh, our electroscope experiment, if you were to have this rod being neutral, but you bring the electroscope nearby, what's going to happen, or sorry, if, if you bring the charged rod nearby, and this conducting rod here is neutral. The charges on the conducting rod, remember it's a conductor, the charges are free to roam around. The like charges, the charges that are like the charged rod, they're going to flee toward the flaps and they're going to repel from each other even if you haven't actually touched the charged rod to the conducting rod of the electroscope. So that 
in this case, it's not charging by induction yet, but it, re it results in what we call induced polarization. That you end up having a polarized effect. Same thing in this solid. You have temporarily polarized this solid in terms of the fact that it ends up having a net negative charge on this side and a net positive charge on this side due to the fact that there is a positively charged rod nearby but it is temporary. As soon as you take this positively charged rod away, everything is going to go back to the status quo. But there is a little trick that we, we can discuss before we get into lightning. This trick would be if you were to go back to this electroscope, if you actually had a ground wire going from this metal rod to well, the ground, then what would happen, let's pretend that this rod here was positively charged. If you brought this positively charged rod near, but not touching, not touching the conducting rod, then the positive charges on the conducting rod would end up fleeing out the ground wire and trying to get away. Well, what if after that has had time to occur and equilibrate, you took a pair of scissors and cut the ground wire? Well, now the positive charges don't have any way of coming back, and now you remove the rod. Now you remove this positively charged rod. Well, what has happened here? Then in that case, these, the, this metal rod has been left with a negative charge, and that is what we call charging by induction. So whenever you charge something by induction, the result is that you the thing that you've charged by induction has the opposite charge as what as the rod that you brought near in order to allow this to occur. So if you brought a positively charged rod nearby, then the conducting rod, after you've cut the ground wire with the positively charged rod nearby, would have a negative charge. And then when you bring the positively charged rod away, it still has that negative charge because the ground wire has been cut. So those positive charges that flew out the ground wire are, have no way of returning. So now let's turn our attention to lightning. So what about Ben Franklin's kite and bells experiment? So Ben Franklin potentially could have died here. Uh, as far as we know, the kite itself wasn't actually struck by lightning. What ended up happening was lightning struck nearby. And when lightning struck nearby, this ended up resulting in enough of an electric potential that the key itself was able to become charged, even though the key itself was not actually um, struck by the lightning. And in becoming charged by this process, it was able to exhibit this cool little phenomenon of corona discharge. And you can actually simulate this yourself by taking a pair of keys as in this case, these keys belong to my old mentor, Tony Wayne, and he ended up uh, using a Tesla coil to charge them, turned off the lights, and you could actually see the discharge out of this. This is called corona discharge because what ends up happening is all these charges are kind of accumulating over here with a strong enough electric field to cause what we call dielectric breakdown in the air molecules, and the air molecules end up becoming conducting, near, at least near around here, and you end up having this nice little uh, glow as the air molecules become conducting, charge flows out, the air molecules become ionized, and as they recombine, you end up getting the electrons cascading down from higher energy levels to lower energy levels, creating this nice little light. But what you're essentially seeing here is, to a large extent, plasma. This phenomenon also exists in the form of St. Elmo's fire, which could be seen on the masts of ships. And sailors often interpreted it as a good omen, but I guess what was really going on was that the sailors who managed to survive interpreted it as a good omen, because this is actually a sign that the ship is about to get struck by lightning. And you can see a similar phenomenon of the St. Elmo's fire on an airplane flying at a high altitude in an area of where you can have a lot of rubbing, of course, so re high altitude, but not high enough that the density of the air is small, and that ends up rubbing the wing of the plane, triboelectric effect type of thing, and as that ends up recombining, you end up getting lightning, so to speak, that, um, kind of coming out of the wing of the plane. It's a really cool situation. 
Now Ben Franklin also performed a nice little experiment with these bells. So here's the idea with these bells, and this is something that we'll explore in more detail with a video if we ever return to class. But with these bells, he had two bells. One had a wire that ended up going up the side of his wall in his house, up into up to the roof, and up over the roof. And another bell had a wire going toward the ground. And in the middle, he had a hanging metal ball. So all three of these are conductive, as are, of course, the wires. Now, what happens when a thunderstorm comes nearby? A thundercloud might have a strong uh, negative charge at the bottom. And what's that strong negative charge going to do? That strong negative charge is going to uh, basically attract uh, positive charge out, out, out in the wire up here, but in particular it's going to chase negative charges out of this bell right here. And that's really the big thing in this case. It's going to be chasing these negative charges out of this bell, out of this wire into the ground, and the result is going to be that this bell ends up having really whatever charge the ground has, which is probably a positive charge. So what that does is it induces polarization on this metal ball. The light charges end up flying to the other end, the, unlight, the opposite charges are on the close end, but the close end feels a stronger force, so the metal ball ends up touching this bell. What, is, what happens when it ends up getting attracted toward and pulled toward this bell and touches it? It ends up accumulating whatever charge is on this bell. Well now it has accumulated the light charge of this bell and it ends up getting repelled from this bell and toward this bell. Well, what happens when it approaches this bell? It ends up approaching this bell and the same charge by, or the same induced polarization occurs. The like charges go to the opposite end, the unlike to the near end, and it ends up being attracted toward this bell, Newton's third law in this case, because it's actually this that really has the charge on it, but the same idea is occurring here. And it ends up touching this bell, and that ends up kind of either draining its charge or giving it the charge, um, whatever charge is on this bell, and the process ends up getting repeated. So normally a wire to the ground here would end up leading to a neutral charge on this bell, but thing is, usually when you have a thundercloud overhead, the charge on the ground is the opposite of whatever the charge is at the bottom of the thundercloud. So I did want to mention that in this case, as you can see in this picture. So about three quarters of the time in a thundercloud it's negative charges that have accumulated at the bottom of the cloud and positive charges at the top and these negative charges end up inducing a positive charge on the ground of earth right underneath so what's the result of this eventually the electric field we'll talk about electric fields in a future video but eventually the electric field that's caused by this setup ends up becoming so strong that it starts to kick electrons off of air molecules and when that happens the air molecules are now ionized there instead of being a gas they are a plasma and electric currents run really well through plasmas and that's kind of a runaway effect once that occurs and you end up getting a lightning strike. But what ends up happening is the electrons first kind of, remember the electrons are uh, much less massive than protons and other positive charges here, so these electrons end up tra traveling from the cloud to the ground. But when they end up meeting the positive charges here, now the connection is complete and there's a channel um, through which these end up going. And the actual glow, which occurs when you have a very rapid transfer of charge, the glow, which is what we call the lightning bolt, actually goes from the ground up. Now again, I mentioned that you have this setup occurring about three quarters of the time. So we, yeah, we say cloud to ground lightning, but the flash goes from the ground to the cloud. The charges are going from the cloud to the ground, but the flash goes from the ground to the cloud. So why can't you dodge a lightning strike? It's like, well, maybe you have incredibly good reflexes, superhuman reflexes. Well, the problem is, the once you actually see the lightning strike, that's the glow after the circuit has already been completed. It's too late. The charge, the charges are already flowing. You have already been struck when you see the glow. 
You can also get this type of tribal electric effect occurring in areas around volcanoes. This was when the um, famous volcano Eye of Jotlerjökull on Iceland erupted about 10 years ago, this video being made in 2020. And this was the volcanic eruption that caused a big shutdown in European air travel and everything and because of the dust from the volcano itself. But some nice lightning displays from this occurred. Now, in this case, you're dealing with rubbing of various silicate and other particles in the smoke due to the winds of the volcano. In the case of thunderstorms, you're dealing with something similar. You have upward moving air currents rubbing against downward moving air currents in the clouds, and this rubbing ends up rubbing off charges, triboelectric effect again. The exact mechanism of this is still under investigation, but that's the general idea, and something similar occurs in these volcanoes. Now, in terms of lightning safety, something that we want to discuss and we'll, that we'll discuss in more detail in class with some videos as well if we end up coming back to class. But here we have a situation where a bunch of cows apparently felt that a thunderstorm was coming, so they all end up moving toward a fence. Well, this turned out not to be a good idea because what ended up happening was that these cows, since they were kind of in contact with the fence and they were in contact with each other, they ended up creating what we call a large potential difference. Think of it this way. Let's say that lightning strikes nearby in a field. Well, where is the electric um, potential, so to speak, the voltage going to be strongest? Well, it's going to be strongest where the lightning bolt has actually struck. And the farther you go away, the weaker it actually is. But something that we're going to discuss, especially when we get into electric circuits, it's not about what the what the so-called voltage amount is. Um, what matters is the voltage difference, what we often call the electric potential difference. In other words, if I'm touching something that's charged to a million volts, I'll be quite fine as long as I'm touching something else that isn't that is charged to some other amount that's also pretty close to a million volts. In that case, there's no um, potential difference and the charges are not going to flow through me. But in this case, what happened was the lightning bolt struck somewhere in that field and the electric potential was very strong near where the lightning struck and it was much weaker farther away. But these cows were all kind of connected to each other either through the fence or through touching each other. So there's a very large potential difference from first cow to last cow and the result was that a very large current ended up flowing through all of them and you ended up getting instant stake except unfortunately they, they ended up being undercooked but they all ended up dying. So another bad example of this was in 1939 when over 800 sheep were killed all at once when they gathered under a tree that was struck by lightning. And again, we have some videos on this that I'll end up showing and where a tree gets struck by lightning and you can see that the whole, sh the whole tree ends up just shining from the uh, temporary fire and very high heat of that lightning strike. A lightning strike produces temperatures in the immediate vicinity of it of around 50,000 degrees Fahrenheit. So that is very hot. Now there's an interesting YouTube video that you can watch where lightning strikes around a field during a televised soccer match and the result is that some of the players go down. But not all of the players go down interestingly enough and that's something else that is important in discussing about lightning safety. So again, it's it's all about that path length. It's so in the case of the cows there was a very large path length which meant a very large electric potential difference between near cow and far cow. Now, if you are let me kind of skip ahead here, if you're in a large field, you do not want to lie down if you are um, worried that lightning is about to strike. Lying down would be a bad thing to do because if you're in a large field, well, if lightning strikes nearby, by lying down, you're creating a large path length between, say, one hand and the opposite foot, and that increases the potential difference that would occur across your body if lightning strikes. Instead, what is suggested to do um, in the Army Field Manual is that you should squat down with your feet 
very close together and kind of your hands over your head to try to minimize that path length and therefore minimize the potential difference. Another possibility if, if you're confident that you can run into a building before the lightning strikes might be to actually uh, just start taking off because in that case you'll either have one leg on the ground or zero feet on the ground but there is a slight possibility there of a direct lightning strike but usually when people say that oh I was struck by lightning when I was in this forest or something they weren't actually struck directly lightning struck nearby and a lot of charge went through them because of the fact that they had that path length in there that caused a reasonably large potential difference through their body so another kind of quick fact about lightning so a typical static discharge from rubbing your feet on carpet actually can discharge about two amps of current that would be enough to kill a person easily but it only happens for a very short period of time about three tenths of a microsecond or 300 nanoseconds and here we're talking about voltages of around 20,000 volts or so but a lightning strike will be at about a hundred million volts and here you're talking about 30 amps of current and it's not just for a tiny fraction of a second necessarily it can be for longer than that if you watch cloud to ground lightning very carefully you'll usually notice that the so-called one flash was actually several flashes in rapid succession but on the planet Saturn lightning bolts can be a million times more powerful even than that so here's a nice picture of a thunderstorm on Saturn um, in an enhanced color taken by the Cassini spacecraft this is using an infrared camera in this case and so-called dragon storm there which was a particularly powerful thunderstorm about a decade ago now what about getting into a metal car and it gets struck by lightning well, some of you might have experienced this before. You, you're in a car, and the car itself actually gets struck by lightning, and you end up being fine. So, question is, why is that safe? Because it's a metal car. You would think that the last thing you would want to do is be inside of something that is metal. Now, let me first tell you this. It turns out that if the car had been made of carbon fiber uh, and gotten struck by lightning, um, you would have been fried and it, you you probably would have died in that case although the probability of a carbon fiber car getting struck by lightning is also a little bit less now some people think that it has something to do with the fact that the car is sitting on rubber tires well think about it this way if the electric field that was produced in the air by that thunderstorm was strong enough to allow lightning to go all the way from that cloud that's several thousand feet up all the way down to the top of your car it's certainly going to have no trouble getting from the from the top of the car to the ground so it has whether the, the tar tires are rubber or not even if the tires were metal the same thing would have happened what ends up happening is that the car has created a nice shield around you how does that shield work well it happens because of the fact that um, a conductor is kind of a charged shield it's what we call a Faraday cage and it's because of the fact that it's a conductor the charges are free to roam around so let's take a look at that in a little bit more detail so one of the laws of nature is that the electric field is going to be zero everywhere inside of a conductor as long as we have what we call electrostatic equilibrium which um, believe it or not we can still approximate even the, in the case of a lightning strike and like right before versus right after so what would happen if the electric field was not zero inside of a conductor well the electric field something we'll discuss later on tells you the force per unit charge on a charged particle so if the electric field was not zero that means that there would be a force on these charges well the charges in a conductor remember they're all free to move so the charges are all going to be on the surface of the conductor because they're free to move around they are all repelling from each other because of the fact that these are going to be like charges if there are charges at all so if the electric field wasn't zero inside of a conductor then this would result in forces on the charges to arrange themselves until the electric field is zero so 
this is what we call a Faraday cage in that case. Interestingly enough, um, the fact that this actually works has to do with the fact that the electric force is a force that goes as 1 over distance squared. If it was any other power law, I should mention that the same thing would actually happen if it was proportional to distance, but if it was any other power than being proportional to distance or proportional to 1 over distance squared, then there actually could be an accumulation of charge in the center and this whole Faraday cage and uh, shielding effect wouldn't actually work. So another very interesting result is that if you are actually at kind of going around the conductor um, near pointy ends, charge would tend to accumulate at pointy ends. And that's because of the fact that a conductor is what we call an equipotential surface. In other words, if I tell you that the voltage is 20 volts at one point on this conductor, it's going to be 20 volts everywhere on the conductor. And the only way that can end up working out is if the charge ends up accumulating at the pointy ends of the, of the conductor. Unfortunately, it can't do that enough to make lightning rods dissipate charge, but still it's something that is important in a lot of electrostatic applications. Now, that has to do, by the way, with the fact that uh, one of the other laws is that when you have a conductor, the electric field must always be perpendicular to the surface. Again, we're going to discuss electric fields in more detail later in the unit, but since the electric field is always uh, perpendicular to the surface, that is normal to the surface, um, and the only charge that is on the surface, uh, on on the conductor is on the surface, then it's going to end up getting charge accumulating into the regions that have the smallest radius of curvature. In other words, the pointy ends. So that's what leads to the so-called Faraday cages. So for example, in this case, this one getting charged by probably a few million volts um, of electricity but the person inside is quite fine. Now, if the person ended up sticking a hand in between the bars of this cage, that would probably be bad, at least for the hand. So you wouldn't want to do that. But as long as you're in the cage, you're quite fine. In fact, there's a very nice YouTube video from an America's Got Talent Architect, which was a, Architect was a group of contestants from, I want to say the 2012 show. And they made a number of performances based on uh, the fact that, hey, a person inside of a uh, metal suit is completely fine if they're getting zapped with 2 million volts of electricity. And they actually synced their electricity with music. I shouldn't say synced it with music. They made music with their electricity. This also occurred in the movie Sorcerer's Apprentice. There's a nice example of that in the movie Sorcerer's Apprentice as well. Not the Disney version, but the new version. So if you're in a building that has lots of metal around it, that also acts as a nice Faraday cage. For example, inside of tractor trailers, school buses, um, some cars, although obviously this, this particular car is probably unsafe for a lot of other reasons, at least the fact that it has poor steering, poor braking, and poor acceleration. But also inside of a lot of places like Walmarts, um, you might have noticed sometimes inside of a Walmart that your cell phone reception is not very good. Well, that's because of that Faraday screening effect. It ends up also kind of screening out the cell phone signal, though nowadays that's less of an issue because of more modern technology with cell phones. But if you place a handheld radio inside of a metal wire cage, it's not going to get any reception. So what does this mean about lightning striking a body of water? Are you actually safe in a pool, a lake, or an ocean that gets struck by lightning? Well, it turns out you might be. So there's a link to a, a tragic story that occurred back in summer of 2012. And the situation was that a group of girls was swimming in a swimming pool, a public swimming pool, and a power line went down and came into the pool area. And the the water was charged, but the lifeguards were kind of just trying to get everybody out of the pool, and they all ended up swimming to safety uh, by swimming to the side of the pool and getting out all except for one. There was one girl who unfortunately ended up swimming to the ladder. And the ladder of a swimming pool, as you know, is generally made out of metal. As soon as she grabbed that, 
um, she ended up getting a lot of current going through her, and unfortunately they were unable to save her. But what also uh, became remarkable to me from that story was that the other kids in the pool, they were fine as long as they didn't touch the metal ladder, which ended up uh, basically giving another path for the electricity to go. So, and they ended up getting out and being quite safe. So it makes you kind of wonder, it's like, would you potentially be safe um, if lightning strikes, um, well, maybe not right on you, but um, in a body of water somewhat far away? And I, I think just thinking about that situation you might be. Now keep in mind that you can't swim forever and that's one of the reasons why they want you to get out of the pool and everything because also the lifeguards are in danger and the lifeguards need to be there if uh, somebody is in the pool. So there's also that to consider as well for why they try to get everybody out of a swimming pool if there's a thunderstorm nearby. Now what does this all have to do with sharks? Well a lot of sharks, hammerhead sharks in particular, have these cute little electric receptors on the underside of their heads, so to speak. And these are able to, uh, also sawfish, which are another type of shark, have these as well. But these electroreceptors have, let's see, let me come back to this, these electroreceptors are able to sense the the motions and electrical signals of any prey that might be around in the sand. Um, prey that, that once they end up sensing them, they go after them and consuming them. So all sharks have something like this. They, they have these various electroreceptors which um, go are wired very well to their brain and that's one of the things that makes them such fearsome predators and you can actually see some of these things in the case of this hammerhead shark right here these these little holes these end up serving as these electroreceptors so definitely don't want to tangle with one of these when they're hungry now the duck-billed platypus also has the ability to do this as well as does the echidna. Uh, they, they can also sense electric fields that are emitted by, well, things that they're trying to eat. So that does it for our discussion today about introduction to electrostatics and hopefully you found some of the information about lightning safety and electric fields and um, Faraday cages to be somewhat interesting and useful. And next time we're going to turn our attention to electric fields themselves, how to calculate them, calculate what their effects are going to be, and then eventually in calculating the forces felt by charged particles. So. Hope to see you then, and if you have any questions, please let me know. Thank you.